You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to All About Nursing with your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Executive Nurse Advisor Dr. Batchelor will present the significant role nurses play in providing health care in a multitude of health care settings. Listen to some of today's key nurses who work and practice in academia settings and talk about the challenges they face in today's modern medical world. So please welcome the host of All About Nursing, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Good evening. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor, on All About Nursing, and we're live on the BBM Global Network in TuneIn Radio. I have a very distinguished guest with me this evening, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about him. This is Dr. Jason Farley, who is the professor of nursing at the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing, an infectious disease trained nurse epidemiologist and a nurse practitioner in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. His research has been focused on developing strategies to optimize diagnosis, navigation, linkage, engagement, and retention in care for persons with infectious diseases, including studies designed to keep patients engaged in care over long periods of illness. He is currently serving on the front line of the SARS COVID-2 response at both the Johns Hopkins Hospital as well as the Baltimore City Health Department to stand up community-based testing sites and improve infection control procedures. He is the HIV Prevention Trials Network site leader for Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and lead investigator for a number of SARS COVID-2, COVID-19 studies in collaboration with the COVID-19 Vaccine Prevention Network. He has extreme experience in lots of different research and I think we're gonna really enjoy hearing from him this evening. So welcome, Dr. Farley. So, um, Jason, maybe we could start with you telling the audience a little bit about when and how you decided to become a nurse. Well, it's interesting um, that we're juxtaposing, you know, my career with um, what's happening right now um, to everyone across the world with the the COVID-19 pandemic, because my career began because of another pandemic, and that's the HIV um, epidemic, pandemic, um, if you will. Um, I grew up in the um, rural south, uh, outside of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and um, was seeing um, basically people across the world uh, become ill and sick in the early 90s uh, from HIV. I'm a child born in the 70s, but um, didn't know a whole lot about what was going on in the 80s. But in the early 90s, I I came to, to recognize what was happening. Uh, and in places like Alabama, there was a huge amount of stigma associated with the disease. And so from the, you know, from the pastor in the pulpit to, um, you know, the things you were seeing in high school and then eventually college, uh, it really struck me uh, with a need for uh, no, not only compassion, but as a member of myself of the LGBTQ community, I, I really wanted to um, think about how I could give back. And nursing was a perfect um, profession and career to consider uh, at that time. I was waffling on medicine versus nursing. I uh, did not know of the role of the nurse practitioner at the time. Um, thought, oh my goodness, you know, what if I spend four years in pre-med and, and, and then don't go to medical school or, or you know, bomb the MCATs? I, I really, you know, my personality didn't allow me to have uh, not without a fallback plan. And I, so I thought, okay, I want to go to nursing school And by the time I finished nursing school, I was so in love with the profession, I never even applied um, to become a physician. I I just decided that, you know, uh, I had found my calling. I I really um, 
loved the humanistic elements of the profession and how much that we got to be in the most tender and profound moments of a patient's life. I um, really got to experience that in the 1917 clinic at UAB uh, where all there was was really good nursing care. I, I was training right at that point where antiretroviral therapy or highly active antiretroviral therapy, as we called it at the time, or heart, was just coming on the scene and patients were getting access to protease inhibitors. And so the sequelae of living with HIV for 15 years at that point approximately was, was profound. So I got to see and be there and hold people's hands in their last moments of life and, and really also then see the same uh, almost clinical experience in nursing school, see patients turn around and almost have a Lazarus-like effect where they literally came back from what was seemingly a death sentence. So um, my, my journey began there, and that, that has really um, speared my passion for the profession ever since. Well, that's really remarkable. Um, and I was curious, can you share some highlights of your career and, like, and, and how you got to where you are today? Well, uh, a, a lot of degrees <laughs> is the first thing. So, um, um, you know, after finishing my bachelor's degree in nursing, um, you know, like I, I said, I had heard about this wonderful role of the advanced practice nurse. But I was told at that time we, we gave our students, in, you know, in the early 90s, the instruction of, no, you must practice at the bedside before you go on to become a nurse practitioner. Um, not different than a little bit today and when we think about many going directly from, from their, you know, their first degree nursing program into advanced practice roles, but at the time. So I took a job at the VA Medical Center uh, caring for patients with um, significant and severe mental illnesses, bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, um, uh, as well as um, you know, borderline personality disorder uh, amongst the A patients. And also about half of my time was associated with research. And so thinking about the, the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, how do we get the paranoid schizophrenic to participate in a brand new therapeutic trial of a new drug, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really spearheaded my thinking around a research career at that moment. And so I enrolled in an MPH program, new infectious disease was my passion and my love uh, that the job at the VA in mental health was really uh, a necessity at the time. We actually had a workforce surplus uh, when I graduated from nursing school. And so jobs were very hard to come by. So I entered uh, into the VA and then entered the MPH program in infectious disease epi, uh, finished that degree program. Uh, and, and decided to apply uh, to Johns Hopkins to do the nurse practitioner program uh, after that. Um, and then once you get the bug of, uh, you know, uh, funny for the infectious disease uh, person in me, but once you get the, the, the bug <laughs> of Johns Hopkins, it's hard to, it's hard to, to leave that kid in a candy store mentality. Um, you really are given um, a, a carte blanche of thinking about and designing and, and really um, shaping the career that you see before you in the way that is potentially not possible in, in other sites. So after finishing um, the nurse practitioner training, again, a focus in infectious disease, particularly HIV uh, clinical management at that time, I began in our HIV practice and I'm still there today. Um, and I enrolled in our PhD program with the intent of, of changing lives and, and going back to my first love uh, after, after that time in, um, in our, my mental health uh, clinical experience. So I went back to the, the um, caring for patients with HIV and, and, and then began my program of research from there. That's awesome. And you have a very impressive uh, story. And, uh, and it's interesting, as you were talking, I was just thinking about how diverse already your career was in, in terms of the kinds of patients that you were seeing, and yet there are similarities for how I'm sure that those kinds of um, talents that you were learning in one field was helping in another. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I was curious, um, 
that you now are serving as the director and founder of the REACH initiative, which is an infectious disease center within Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing. And I was curious what the major issues are that you and your team are working on. It's a, it's a wonderful question. And I am surrounded by such great and passionate um, team members really thinking about how do we end HIV first and foremost in Baltimore. So we work a lot with the Baltimore City Health Department driving down new cases, seeking and trying to find new cases of, of HIV, linking them to care, making sure they're engaged in care. Uh, so we do, um, we lead a program with the Baltimore City Health Department for those who are, are not living with HIV. So we use pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP uh, through telemedicine approaches and, and novel uh, community-driven strategies to try to get people to be diagnosed uh, if they're living with a virus, but also screen for other things that may place them at risk, like substance abuse and, and STIs. So through a variety of community initiatives, we will we'll be at public libraries helping people to access HIV and STI testing, hepatitis C testing. Uh, we'll be at, at grocery stores, tr tr non-traditional community venues trying to improve access for folks who might have a stigma about showing up to an emergency department or to a primary care office. And, and seeking HIV testing, for example. Um, on the HIV side of once someone is diagnosed with HIV, our team works really diligently to, to help them get linked to care and started on antiretroviral therapy. So we'll refer patients to rapid start programs, um, meaning they can get treatment started the very same day they're diagnosed if they would like. Um, and run through my clinic, actually, the Johns Hopkins Bartlett Clinic. We will also we have a getting to zero community health worker program and getting to zero obviously means getting to zero new HIV infections. And what I think it's really important for everyone to realize is in the past, you know, almost 40 years, uh, we just celebrated uh, our remembrance of world AIDS day on December 1st. And in that almost 40 year period, we now have all the tools we need to completely eliminate HIV. We have a prevention strategy that's up to 92 to 99% effective in some populations. We have a treatment as prevention. So if I treat a patient's viral load to, to some viral suppression, um, they cannot transmit HIV onto their partners. Uh, and then, so really, when we think about the, the, that, that place where we're at in HIV care, it's back to nursing because it's about to, back to engagement. It's back to retention. It's about to the things that facilitate adherence behaviors and not about the treatment, yes or no, because we can give every, almost everyone a single tablet, one pill, once a day regimen. That's pretty amazing because I remember, it wasn't, doesn't seem like it was that long ago, that we were losing people just, uh, gosh, on a daily basis. And you were constantly seeing more and more loved ones that were being impacted by HIV and um and I, I can remember thinking, too, that for so long as I had practiced as a nurse, how many patients I had been around were without protective gear on and got stuck by needles and things that we hadn't worried about as much. But, boy, that really changed a lot of practices when we started to realize that we needed to work and think differently. So that's pretty amazing to hear what you're saying in terms of the prevention and the treatments. And I and it's really treated kind of like as a chronic disease now rather than what seemed like a very acute episode that was causing a lot of deaths. Uh, is, is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it, it is a chronic infectious disease um, yeah. that requires lifelong treatment, lifelong adherence. Um, so it's similar, if you think about it, to diabetes, right? If I, if I have a newly diagnosed diabetic, standard of care means I place them on metformin often twice a day. So right now, today, if I have a newly diagnosed HIV patient, it's one pill once a day. The treatment of HIV is now, quite frankly, more simple than the treatment of run-of-the-mill diabetes uh, initially diagnosed. And, and that's, a, that's a hallmark of the, the advance of an in infectious disease care in general. And HIV has really driven that. One of the main reasons, frankly, we've been able to get a diagnosis respond so quickly and get a vaccine even potentially uh, on the horizon has been the work that has gone on uh, in, in many ways in the, in the setting of HIV.
Well, oh, that's really awesome. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. This is um, All About Nursing. I'm Dr. Troy Spatchler. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and it's time for us to take a short break. Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of current and concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show, and I have Dr. Jason Farley with me this evening, who is a professor of nursing at the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing and an infectious disease-trained nurse epidemiologist and nurse practitioner in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins. And before the break, <clears throat> Jason was telling us about the work that he leads as the director and founder of the REACH Initiative, which is an infectious disease center within Johns Hopkins uh, School of Nursing. And you were telling us a little bit about some of the major issues. And I was curious if there's a little bit more that you want to tell us about that before hearing about the kind of research that it's leading you to. Yeah. So one of the things that were really critical to me in developing a, a, a center uh, within within nursing was that it had to be action oriented. It that that research alone took too long for my impatient nature. So a lot of the work we do is is situated within implementation science, but action oriented research, in which we are doing a lot of um, programmatic design and development, um, like I was describing before, the HIV, the STI testing, the prep telemedicine programs. We're all going on way before COVID. Um, because we increasing access to care is a driving motivator for me, uh, because I think we should be able to democratize healthcare as much as possible, make it um, really liberate all the barriers uh, that patients face in getting access. So, when we think about the way we interact with the community at the Reach Initiative, we we do events like health entertainment, meaning, hmm. for example, if you were to do a a health fair. Right, and invite people to come out for diabetes and blood pressure screening and all of those kind of things. You're likely to get, you know, a good segment of the population interested in those kind of things. But when you start to talk about stigmatized illnesses like HIV, it's harder to do those kinds of events. So you have to get creative. And our center really has designed several kind of innovative approaches to access and engage the community in ways that help them bring them out for an entertainment event, but situate health within that circumstance. For example, we offer a, what we would call a status neutral approach. So for targeting the LGBTQ community in Baltimore City, we're having some form of event um, where there's an entertainment 
piece to that event. Uh, we'll bring in, you know, um, you know, folks from New York City to talk about a, a new LGBTQ film and show the film and do those kind of things. Um, but when we do that, we offer HIV or hepatitis or STI testing as well as social services like getting access to uh, a Medicaid expansion providers and those kinds of things. Well, in that circumstance, it doesn't matter if you're living with HIV or not. Through our status neutral approach, there's no way that anyone in the, in the community would be able to tell your status by whether or not you visit the HIV testing booth or not. So we implement a system where people can go around from station to station and, and implement like a passport to health. Um, and with that passport, as they go from station to station visiting, they will get access to an ability to uh, win prizes at the end of the evening. So That's great. Our really, yeah, our team really is trying to engage in very action-oriented ways. Now, but through an implementation science approach, we'll go back and we'll evaluate how many people got tested? How successful was that? How, how did that recruitment event um, ultimately lead to patients being accessed and linked to care and, and receiving services? That's wonderful. I, I think that um, as you were describing that, I was thinking it would be great if we could do something like that with mental health issues as well, since there's still stigma associated, because I've heard people talking about how the telehealth has really jumped the numbers of mental health consults because there's less stigma because no one knows you're calling in instead of potentially being seen walking into a building. So, you know, that's great that you've been able to learn how to do this. Um, that's awesome. So, Jason, is there research and program outcomes that you're really trying to achieve? Are you measuring the impacts on all of this? Sure. So, um, we've got a couple of different, um, in, in addition to our implementation work that I was talking about, we have about uh, five or six different research projects that where our center is engaged with. and. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, my global work and the center's global work has really focused is on, on is TB and HIV research. And the reason for that is that TB is the global leading cause of death for people living with HIV. And our work focuses in South Africa. And so we've developed, uh, uh, we're finishing up right now a cluster randomized trial of nurse case management to improve adherence and engagement in care and retention in care. And so that's a, that involves 10 hospitals across two provinces of South Africa. Um, we're moving, as, as that study is wrapping up and, and we're thinking about the lessons learned and the implications of that, uh, we're look, looking at a couple of different novel approaches to follow that model up. You know, one of the things about a nurse case management model is that nurses, fortunately, are expensive in all environments. And what, what can we unpack from that nurse and share with a lower cadre of health workers, such as community health workers? And so both in South Africa and in Baltimore, we have a variety of initiatives to consider how we would engage with community health workers as well as technology to facilitate um, some of the similar access engagement and retention strategies. So in South Africa, we have what we're calling a triggered escalating community health worker intervention. So um, one of the things that's really critical for community health workers is to have a very detailed you know, set of instructions, if you will, of this is what you do, this is how you do it, this is how you measure it, this is what your structure is, particularly in South Africa. And through mHealth or mobile health through apps, we're able to facilitate um, the community health worker monitoring the patient through video directly observed therapy for their TB treatment. So the community health worker watches the patient take their treatment via a video that the, community, that the patient submits. They're able to answer brief and simple questions about potential side effects they've had, and they're able to receive reminders about their upcoming appointments. The community health worker, if they don't do one of those things, is able to initiate a series of steps. So that's what we call it triggered escalating because step one, sending them a text message reminder. Step two, giving them a phone call. Step three, you know, going and doing a home visit and so on and so forth. Um, so in other words, in a low resource environment where a community health worker may have thousands of patients that they're responsible for, for evaluating, how do we help facilitate the work that they do and, 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 and basically 
to help navigate the community health worker to the right intervention at the right time. Um, so that's in South Africa. Similarly, um, we have an app that I designed at, at, for Baltimore, for Maryland, called Prep Me, which is a community health worker driven app. As soon as a patient downloads the app, um, you can find out more about the app on prepmaryland.org. That's P-R-E-P, -E Maryland.org. Um, and you can find the app, and, and when you're looking at that app, um, if you download our community health workers, if you're in the state of Maryland, automatically reach out to you to say, hi, are you interested in HIV prevention services? How can we help you tell you more about it? We're happy to do a phone call. We're happy to do a, a, a referral. Uh, they will even help them engage in um, insurance programs to get them set up for insurance. So again, that community health worker model, looking at it both in uh, low resource setting and in um, Baltimore as well. So, and then our, our research most recently has really pivoted to COVID-19 and, and uh, be happy to talk more about that. Well, that's fascinating. As you were describing that, I was wondering too, how do you, how does that get paid for in terms of having people that are dedicated to doing that? Because it's, that's important work. I was just curious, uh, is that just something that's supported by the organization because you can see the difference that it's making? It's, it's a great question. Um, so right now we're funded for our Baltimore city work through two different grant initiatives. One is through the Baltimore City Early Intervention Services, which comes through the Ryan White uh, HIV program at HRSA. The second one is also through Baltimore City, and it's through the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative that was um, authorized under the Trump administration. And so the, the various funding uh, right now is also coming through HRSA as well. Um, so those two funding streams for the Baltimore City are, are funded in that way. In South Africa, our work has been funded by the NIH and most recently by a discovery award from Johns Hopkins University uh, for innovative models of research. Well, that's wonderful. And I would imagine as you get the results, the insurance companies are going to be very interested in supporting that as would I would hope Medicare and all of that. So that's amazing work. Thank you so much for sharing that. I was curious if you wanted to tell us a little bit more about your program of infectious disease research. And, and you've mentioned a few times like what you're doing with COVID, which is always kind of fascinating. But um, um, maybe you could tell us a bit more about the research program that you're doing. Sure. Um, so with COVID-19, we are a part of the Coronavirus Prevention Network, or COVPN, which was established uh, by the CARES Act uh, with money that flew, flowed through to NIH. And right now we have uh, three protocols uh, through the uh, COVPN network. And I have a fourth protocol that I'm a co-PI on with colleagues um, separately. So I'll talk about the COVPN protocols first. Um, really they're designed to uh, analyze First and foremost, the immune response to COVID-19. So we're looking for people who are um, uh, newly diagnosed with COVID-19 and looking at their immunologic response. Um, so we'll be evaluating them uh, repeatedly over a series of days once that they have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, a second protocol looks at a community prevalence protocol and we'll be looking at patients from nursing homes, health clinics, as well as um, random uh, businesses that have been chosen as part of the protocol. So we may show up at a target uh, at a location and offer testing to uh, a randomly selected subset of people walking into the target uh, just to manage both um, PCR. So we're looking for the virus as well as the antibody to see community prevalence and zero prevalence of COVID, for COVID-19. Uh, and then I think one of the most important uh, protocols that I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about is our comparative effectiveness protocol. Um, well, we just received, received co-investigators uh, of mine in the School of Medicine and School of Public Health, and I received a rapid acceleration of diagnostics or RADx up grant from NIH um, to do comparative effectiveness for to evaluate testing uh, strategies for COVID-19. 
And so in that study, we will compare three different modalities of COVID-19 testing. One is where we'll send the patient a, a home kit where they'll te- self-test at home. The second is a mobile van lo- strategically located in the various communities. And the third is standard of care, fixed site, you schedule an appointment and come in for COVID-19 testing. And we really want to see the timeliness of results and how those results, once the patient has their COVID-19 results, may or may not influence their behavior. Do they isolate? Do they stay at home? Do they quarantine? Uh, do they avoid contact with others once they've received those results? And, and, de- and depending on that turnaround time, how quickly we can give them those results, we hypothesize that that will, that will change behavior for most, uh, not all, and that we will see uh, a reduction in movement um, and a reduction in other contacts after diagnosis. But that each modality of testing will be differentiated by the system. Meaning, if I have to schedule an appointment, wait till it's been, I've been called for that appointment, get in a queue, uh, you drive through a testing modality for a fixed site standard of care, that will take longer particularly with backlogs, than if I'm able to go into my community into a mobile site. Mm-hmm. Now, Absolutely. Flip home, yeah. yeah, flip that to the home arm of that, right? And then you've got to add mail time, right, of both sending the kit and sending it back to patients. And so mm. is home-based testing, although it's the most convenient, more akin in terms of turnaround time to that, those patients who have um, fixed site standard of care testing? That's interesting. You know, as you were talking, I was also <clears throat> curious because um, a lot of this requires people to like really cooperate with you and, and being honest about what they're doing. And I just, I, I know that there's still so many people feeling like this is still a hoax of some sort. And so uh, it might be good to chat a little bit about how do you, how can we really help the public understand that this is not an invasion of their privacy, that this is real, et cetera. Maybe we can talk about that in just a little bit. It's time for us to take a break. So we are coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We'll continue the conversation when we come back. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale, an international initiative called Nurse now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. This is all about nursing. We're live on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio. And I have Dr. Jason Farley with me this evening. And before the break, he was telling us about the incredible work that he's leading in terms of research around COVID-19 and the different ways you're going to study the 
uh, timeliness and the effectiveness of having the ability to do testing in different ways. And so I, I, it, you may want to say a little bit more about that because uh, we had to go to commercials. I wanted to give you the chance to add on to that if you'd like. Sure. Um, well, you know, I think ultimately we, we have to know the, how well this virus has penetrated into various communities. So one of the things that we're doing with this research is, is really trying to take a population representative sample. So with that sampling approach, we have stratified, you know, by census block group across Baltimore in order to oversample from communities that may typically be underrepresented in research. So, so we have nine different strata by race, ethnicity, and income that we are looking at to try to sample from so that we can make sure that we know, you know, if you're white and you're poor or if you're black and you're rich or, you know, if you're Latin and you're middle income, then we can uh, pro help to determine what the prevalence is in different populations um, in Baltimore City. And that's really important to us because we really want to understand what, what this is doing to people and because we, we don't yet know and that's why we will follow, once enrolled in our cohort, um, we will follow them for 12 months. We don't yet full, fully know the full spectrum of illness. So once we enroll someone, we offer them the testing modality. They can then, after enrollment and they complete that, that testing, choose the modality of their choice. And we will follow them in this. So for the next 12 months, if it's more convenient to have an out-home kit, sent to them and they want that and they try that and they, they like that, they can continue that. Um, or if it's more convenient to just go through the drive through scheduled fixed site appointments, they can choose that. So this, this element of choice that's introduced into the study, which to me, as a you know, behavioral scientist, really focusing on things that help patients be adherent to care is is critical piece for me. And it, it really reflects that, that nursing lens that I lend to the study compared to my epidemiologists and, and, and School of Medicine colleagues. You know, as you're talking about that, I mean, the, that's exactly what the pandemic has shown is that these health inequities are certainly popping up in terms of who's most vulnerable for a lot of the really severe cases of COVID-19. And we've had social determinants of health out there for a while and the need to work on it. But I think that uh, the work that you're talking about will really help us uh, continue to figure out how to accelerate fixing the issues around health and equity. So thank you for sharing that. I think it might be fun for you to also share, because you are currently a still maintaining a clinical practice at Johns Hopkins in infectious disease, and it might be good for the audience to know a little bit more about with how successful your research career, why you've chosen to also remain in the clinic caring for patients. Well, I, I tell my students this story uh, about where, uh, you know, I once had uh, a well-meaning department chair tell me that I must get off the fence. And as an academic and a researcher um, who was, you know, successful in my research career, that I should stop straddling the clinical research fence. And I told her, that I would be will that this was the one issue that she and I would disagree about, and I would throw myself onto a sword um, about this one issue. That I believe that the the fundamentally best researchers are the ones who are exceptionally clinically grounded. Um, so, you know, half the time that I'm not uh, doing my COVID work, or I'm, you know, not in my telemedicine practice or my prevention service, that, or I'm not engaging in my other things. I'm, I'm, you know, working with with populations to get increased testing and ordering tests as a nurse practitioner for COVID-19. Um, and so that work, both in the HIV clinical practice as well as in my practice in you know helping to order testing for COVID has been instrumental in influencing both my HIV research as well as my COVID-19, you know, the new NIH grant uh, that we received. So I 
can't see my career without that, you know, that foot in the door in the clinical practice arena. It informs my research on a, a routine basis. And my patients, quite frankly, give me the joy and the benefit of seeing an immediate outcome mm-hmm. of the work that I do. Yeah, as you say that, I was thinking about how I always missed being at uh, taking care of patients because the work as a, a leader took longer to see results and you could have a, you know feel like you've really made a difference as you're at the bedside with patients and I always used to tease that when I was feeling like I wasn't getting anywhere with leadership I'd go home and vacuum so I could see instant results at home and take out the trash and feel like I completed something (laughs) so I I think as you're describing that you know that's that's a really good way to also stay very grounded and so I would say good for you that you're doing that I think that's wonderful um so I was curious go ahead yes if I if I might add to that you know I have the privilege of working alongside some amazing physician colleagues who have very high level um, administrative responsibilities. Maybe it's at the CDC or maybe it's at HRSA or maybe it's at uh, NIH, right? And the thing that I admire most about these great colleagues who don't need to be in clinic as well is that they, many of them, have maintained that clinical practice and have you know, one day a week or one day a month, um, will still come into the clinic and see patients, even if they're um, the HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau director, uh, medical director. Um, and I, I, I have always found that exemplar uh, of our physician colleagues. And this, I'm not talking about the attending in the clinic who sits and, you know, basically just waits on something to go wrong. I, I'm talking about a primary care provider who comes in and sees their, their HIV patients or their PrEP patients. Uh, in clinic in the same way that I do. So that exemplar, I would say to, you know, my my colleagues out there listening, um, is something that I believe fundamentally we should be following. Uh, Even if we we get, you know, major leadership roles, we should push back and say that, no, I I want this, right? And, And health systems I'm seeing across are very willing to do that for our physician colleagues. So why can't they do that for us in the nursing profession? Yeah, I used to um, think that it would be great if people on the academic side could also do some clinical time just to maintain the um, relevancy and as well as keep current with the kinds of changes that are happening in the practice arena. Because, you know, we always talk about there's a gap between academia and practice. So I think that gap has been widening as a result of how fast paced things are on the clinical side. So uh, is that part of like the Johns Hopkins culture, do you think, or that that's kind of helped to have physicians really wanting to do that and others to do like what you're talking about, maintaining a clinical practice, as well as all the research and things you do? Well, I think it's certainly not easy um, yeah. to, to maintain both. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think it is part of the, the, the Hopkins can-do mentality. <laughs> Um, and but I do think it, there's also this fundamental the things that you know continually impress me with my colleagues uh, you know both in nursing and in medicine and, and in public health for that matter is this great desire to improve the lives of people and 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 not just be masthead authors on their great science and work um, and I, 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 I really do think that um, one of the things that, that really does maybe set our health system apart is there's just so many, too numerous to count exemplars of people who fall into that category, who, who literally have, you know, research portfolios that are so deep that they, they don't need to be in clinical practice, and yet they choose to maintain um, what, quite frankly, is a, a large workload with little return on that investment in terms of the, the academic effort calculus that one does, um, but uh, kind of feeds the soul. Yeah. Yeah, and as you were talking earlier about your population sampling and the health inequities, you know, I think 
a lot of times people may not know where Johns Hopkins sits and is located because you have very vulnerable populations living all around you. And uh, I would imagine that, that the populations around the, the facility have been hard hit with the COVID-19. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, our hardest hit community um, has been our Latinx community. Um, so we have seen a, a large, uh, ep- early in the epidemic, in the March through May timeline, we saw up to 40% of our hospital admissions were among uh, people uh, who clarified themselves as a uh, Hispanic background or Latin, Latin background. Um, and that, that is, you know, given the proportion in our population of 8 to 10%, that is an amazing um, disparity. That, uh, um, it was also higher than you would have expected among the African American population, but but our, I mean, we're talking massive increases among our, our Hispanic population. Um, and and it goes back to what you were saying before about social determinants of health. Um, you know those, you know, real frontline workers, but also the circumstance of of housing crowding, multi generational mm-hmm. families in the same home. Um, limited access to care. Um, there, there were times where I was rounding on some of the inpatient units for COVID-19, and and you basically needed an interpreter in every single room. So, wow. um, on certain on certain units. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating, Jason. Um, thank you for sharing that. We are coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor the host of the show, and we will be right back. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from France. International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866 244 5679 and feel the glory. You are listening to All About Nursing, live in the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show, and I have Dr. Jason Farley, who's been just sharing amazing information around all of the research and and uh, cutting-edge research, actually, that he is doing and his team and the priorities and, uh, I, and uh, that he keeps his clinical practice in addition, which is just very admirable. So, uh, Jason, it might be great to just ask you, um, with all your success in research, it should come as no surprise that you've been chosen by the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing to direct the PhD and DNP, PhD dual degree programs. And I was curious if you could tell us about being the program of director of one of the country's leading PhD programs in nursing. What is this like to be coming up and being in, you know, in charge of all of that? 
Well, the, the students, you know, uh, being able to see them, you know, from the point of making an application to getting admitted to graduating with now their PhD from Johns Hopkins or, or their dual degree DNP PhD from, from Hopkins, it's just a, a privilege. Uh, there's no other way of saying it. Um, you know, we we created the dual degree program, and I say we, uh, Dr. Rita Doust uh, at Johns Hopkins and myself are the co-creators of the, the dual DNP PhD program. And we created that program because both of us really saw this need for taking people who were coming out of wonderful um, either BSN or master's entry programs into nursing who wanted to be advanced practice nurses, but also had a research bug. And so, you know, like myself, who, who did the, this piecemeal, you know, four degree program to get to the PhD after doing a nurse practitioner program, we wanted to save students time. Time equals money. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> our three our three year DNP and our you know, four plus, four and a half to five year PhD got merged together into a five year full time mm -hmm. uh, clinical research intervention scientist program. So one of the things I'm most proud about about being the PhD program director was the the, the latitude I had in innovating in terms of the academic and educational space to create this dual degree program with Rita. So I'm curious because, you know, when they created the DMP degree, they call it a terminal degree. And, and there are many that, including myself, that I've not even thought about going back for a PhD because what I figure out is I'll just go find my PhD friends when I'm wanting to do research stuff. And so were you hearing a lot of people interested in having both Sure. So we, this degree is, is not for everyone. It's, it's very intensive. It is, it is really preparing the advanced practice nurse. So, we, okay. so when we're thinking about our DNP program, we're thinking about those students who want to become a nurse practitioner. And what we ask them to do is marry their clinical interest with their research interest. So, for example, if you come to apply to our program and you are wanting to study dementia, Right. Uh, don't don't make, don't tell us that you want to be a pediatric or an SNP student if if dementia is your area of research. Right. Unless you say to us, hey, the reason I want to do the family nurse practitioner program is I want to study the influence of dementia. It's it's omics, it's genomics, you know, all of the things that infl influences across the entire spectrum of illness and the entire family. Now, that would be a winning case. But if you're really wanting to study a disease of aging, then the adult GRO program, marrying those together, preferably so that you would then spend 50% of your clinical training in a dementia clinic in which you're, you're learning the specialty of dementia from a clinical practice perspective while understanding their primary care needs, right, because you're training in a primary care program. So the primary care of patients with dementia while you're doing your PhD in that same clinic with those same patients, um, researching in that with the same group of, of clinician scientists who you will be mentored by. So that's the goal uh, of this program. It's really to give you know individuals who want that advanced practice nurse experience and, and background the opportunity to, to combine that with their research passion. No, that's fascinating, and actually that sounds like that would be extremely interesting. Do you have a lot of applications for this program? We get about, um, for our entire PhD program all, overall, we 70-plus applications for about 15 slots or so every year. Um, of those, we, we don't have a number of PhD or a number of DNP PhD slots of those 15. Um, we would, if they all were perfect applicants for the DNP PhD, all 15 could be dual degree students. There's no reason we wouldn't do that. Um, but we generally, our cohort sizes of the dual degree program range um, from about four to about seven. Okay. I was curious because the 2020-2030 National Academy of Medicine Future of Nursing Report's not come out yet, but I can't imagine that it won't have something in there around the success of 
having more nurses, doctor prepared, but the need to focus more on uh, how to really have more PhD focused nurses as well. So the program that you're talking about is one that potentially could be looked at because what caught my attention is when you started to tell me about how long it takes to complete your PhD program because what I hear from so many people is that it takes forever to get through a PhD program and, and it's hard to do that if you need to also work and financially it costs a lot of money etc so I was curious about that so that you just answered that question for me um, Jason, I'd be curious because you've told us so many wonderful things and we're going to be coming to the end of the show. Is there anything that you would really like the listeners to take away from tonight if there were like one or two things that you really wanted them to remember? Well, I think, you know, in 2020, the year of the nurse and midwife, um, we have been asked to double down on our commitment to our profession. And I would just like to say to all the nurses out there listening, thank you for doing that. Thank you for, for rising to the occasion of the heroes that you've been every day and are now just getting the recognition that you deserve for. Um, and, you know, for those of us working in infectious diseases, it, it honestly feels like we've been asked to do four additional jobs on, on top of, of everything else that we're trying to maintain. For those of you in the academic space, um, my hat is off to you. You have um, turned programs uh, that were not distance into distance programs, turned programs that were face-to-face and and, uh, synchronous into asynchronous and and distance-based programs, uh, all while trying to make sure that your students, you know, maintain that clinical contact while not getting infected with COVID-19. And for my my clinical uh, colleagues, uh, on the front line, I really just say my heart goes out to you every single day, and I, I'm right there with you. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been highly educational, and I thank you for all you're doing. It's important to research. So uh, thanks for being here this evening. This is All About Nursing. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We've been live on the Beaming Global Network and Tune in Radio, and I hope you'll tune in again next week. Thank you. You've been listening to All About Nursing with your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Tune in each week and get a daily dose of nursing and the healthcare services they provide and how nurses are finding innovative ways to address the key healthcare issues they're facing today. Here on Dr. Joyce Batchelor's All About Nursing. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.